Um, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us in this uh, this week's One Word Seminar. And today I'm very happy to have Professor Stephen Mant uh, to join us and give us a great talk. And Professor Stephen Mant is now an Associate Professor of Computer Science and Statistics at UC Irvine. And previously he was a Senior Researcher and Head of the Statistical Machine Learning Group at Disney Research. And he also did his postdoc at uh, Columbia, Columbia University and Princeton University. Uh, he is also a re uh, recipient of NSF Career Award and the UC Irvine ICS Mid-Career Excellence in Research Award, uh, a Cavley Fellow of the U U.S. National Academy, uh, uh, Academy of Science and a member of the uh, Alice Society and a former visiting researcher at Google Brain. Uh, let's welcome Professor Stephen Mentz. Great talk. Well, thank you so much for uh, for having me. It's it's a great pleasure to speak in this uh, exciting event. <clears throat> uh, so the title of my talk is going to be Compressing Variational Bayes, and I uh, gave it a subtitle from Neural Data Compression to Video Prediction. And um, I'll explain in a moment what I'm planning to cover today. Um, feel free to ask any questions um, or put them in the chat, and I'm trying to answer them as soon as I see them. So in this talk, I will start with um, giving everyone some background on variational inference and approximate Bayesian inference in general, uh, which is sort of the common language that I'll use throughout this talk. And then the goal is afterwards to actually draw surprising connections, or relatively recent connections, between uh, variational inference, which is a scalable way of estimating uh, posteriors, um, and neural data compression. In other words, um, how can we use neural networks to compress data to, uh, with better performance than, for example, traditional image or video codecs? From there, I will then draw another connection, namely from compression and approximate inference to time series forecasting, and in particular video forecasting. And there's actually also another error going back between uh, sequence forecasting and compression. So pretty ambitious agenda. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to cover um, a lot of this. So let me begin by saying, um, you know, something that we probably all already know pretty well. Uh, you know, uh, our world is full of sequential data. You know, sequential data is very important. Uh, if we collect data sets, um, uh, for example, on, in, in an online framework, we'll typically, um, uh, you know, observe the data sequentially. And time is just like, in some sense, a fundamental aspect of the universe. Um, obviously, um, many different data times are inherently sequential in nature. Uh, you know, video is one example, which you can consider a very high dimensional time series where every pixel changes as a function of time. So, you know, if, if a million dimensional uh, time series that you would like to understand, audio data is inherently sequential, uh, but also like the joint angles of a robot arm um, that you observe um, during action is also um, um, a sequential um, data problem. We oftentimes like to draw inference from these different temporal resources. Uh, for example, we might be a robot that observes uh, visual data, acoustic data, and maybe also measurement data from the joint angles. And typically, we'd like to understand the state in which we're currently in, um, in order to then translate these observations into actions. Right. Um, so this is uh, obviously some, something we, we might be interested in. And um, this problem can be dealt with in basically two different ways. Um, first, and more easily, we can treat it as a sort of supervised or dis discriminative problem in which we um, observe, we make a bunch of observations. Um, and ba based on these observations, we might want to, for example, predict the best action that we would like to take in any given moment. Um, in addition to that, we might want to model some um, intermediate time evolving latent states, which we draw on making these predictions. Um, but on the other hand, there's also a generative way of modeling um, such data. Namely, we can assume that there's an underlying hidden state that evolves in time. And based on this hidden state, we actually make, we, we both predict our actions, but we also predict our observations. And then we sort of correct our knowledge about um, the intermediate hidden state by essentially Bayesian inference, right? So we infer the posterior of this generative model, and this way the, we reason about the state of the world that we are currently in. 
Now, the generative view is more technically challenging, but it also has a lot of nice benefits. For example, if the action space uh, actually changes, um, so in other words, if our goal changes, but we actually have learned a good dynamics model of our world, we can easily sort of retrain the existing model on a new task, right? And so hopefully what we've learned about the world is sort of more general and generalizes to different setups. I assume that many of you have already learned about Bayesian inference and deep probabilistic models, but just for the sake of completeness, allow me to kind of frame the setup in which we're, uh, in, which we're in. Um, we want to work with uh, so-called latent variable models, which are uh, considered joint distributions over observed data X and so-called latent unobserved variable Z. Um, and, and the model is characterized by what's called a joint distribution over both var variables. Then using the chain rule of probability, we write this as a um, uh, likelihood P of X given Z in the prior P of Z, the distribution irrespective of any observations. And we're typically interested in two different objects. Sometimes we care about the so-called data marginal likelihood, which is the um, distribution only over observed data with these latent unobserved variables integrated out, right? which you see on the right-hand side. Unfortunately, this is a very high dimensional integral, which we cannot um, compute. And on the next slide, we'll learn about approximations to this integral. On the other hand, we sometimes also want to do inferences over these latent variables. In other words, we want to compute the posterior P of Z given X, which is just the joint distribution divided by this marginal distribution. So in both cases, we're faced with these very high dimensional integrals that we cannot solve efficiently. On the left-hand side, you see an underlying graphical model, which expresses exactly these statistical dependencies reflected in these probability distributions. Variational inference is a tractable way of scalably learning such models. Um, so we can, in other words, we can optimize the parameters of such a, a latent variable model, even if we don't know the exact uh, values that the latent variables take. Uh, so how does this work? Well, you can show um, uh, with, uh, with using Jensen's inequality that the log likelihood is lower bounded by what's called a variational lower bound expectation under Q of the log likelihood ratio between the joint and this variational distribution Q. And this is actually true for any distribution Q of Z given X. Now, if we want to do gradient descent on the log likelihood, which we don't know, we can use the right-hand side instead. And if we pick a member Q that is um, in some sense um, uh, optimally chosen, then we can basically perform a stochastic gradient descent on what's called the evidence lower bound instead of the marginal likelihood. So what we do then in order to train the model is these, uh, are these two alternating steps. First, we search in the space of variational distributions for a good candidate, Q of Z given X. And then once we have that, we plug it into the elbow, the evidence lower bound, and we perform a single um, update on our model parameters. There are many different uh, um, approximations that we can do to our variational distribution Q of Z given X. Uh, the simplest one is called mean field or fully factorized approximation in which we assume that there's no dependencies between the dimensions of Z. Uh, so we can write it as a product over the dimensions. Uh, but in other cases, it makes sense to um, incorporate uh, dependencies in these latent variables, for example, uh, using some order regressive structures. Um, turns out that those are particularly relevant when we model dynamics and we'll, we'll see um, applications of that um, in, in a minute. Um, if you have never heard about variational inference, there's a recent, well, uh, three-year-old review article that um, I can recommend. Now, my group worked a lot on different variational approximations and different variational inference techniques. Maybe you've heard of uh, stochastic gradient descent as variational inference. But um, I want to talk briefly about one particular method um, that ends up being um, particularly useful in this compression space. And this is actually work by uh, Joe Marino, who used to be at Caltech and is now at DeepMind. So imagine you want to search uh, for um, a, a good candidate Q distribution in, in the space of all possible variational distributions. You would typically do this by gradient descent. Um, and imagine that we work with Gaussian distributions, then the variational parameters that you optimize are the means and variances um, of those Gaussian distributions. Now, notably, this would be usually an optimization problem over um, per instance or data point dependent uh, variational parameters. And uh, so what you see on the right-hand side here are two plots showing the elbow 
uh, for a one particular training data point. And you see that this is a non-convex opt optim optimization problem that you can solve using gradient descent. And if, if you iterate that long enough, you will eventually converge to um, the optimum of that, um, of that optimization surface. Now, this is kind of very expensive because you're really having a, you're having a double loop structure, right? You have the outer loop, which is gradient descent on the model parameters, and then you carry out this search over variational parameters in an inner loop. Um, and to avoid that, what people did in, in amortized inference is to directly predict the optimum based on features of your data. So this would be typically then giving you an um, give, uh, result in a suboptimal solution, for example, this green dot here. And it turns out if you do the gradient descent based inference, you do actually better than if you do amortized inference. The difference is called an amortization gap, and we'll get back to that in, in a moment. So what we proposed a few years ago was sort of an interesting middle ground, namely um, something related to meta learning in which you still iteratively um, refine your variational parameters using a couple of iterations. But you don't do this naively based on gradient descent, but rather you train a network F that takes earlier iterations as inputs and also the gradient signal as an input and then uh, predicts the next iteration for lambda. And then it turns out with only a few iterations, you kind of um, can optimize the elbow uh, to a much better degree than if you would just um, do amortized inference. And you're also being much faster than if you do the gradient descent based inference. So we'll get back to this idea of iterative inference in, in a few minutes. All right. Having covered some basics about variational inference as a technique, um, I want to cover then the next topic, which is its interesting connection to neural data compression. The first insight that I would like to promote here is that um, generative modeling can be thought of as um, somehow uh, can be thought of as inverse compression, or in other words, decompression. Or other uh, another way of saying it is compression can be thought of as inverse generative modeling. So what do, I, what do I mean by that? So let's start maybe first with generative modeling, which you might be more familiar with. Um, so what do we do in generative modeling? We assume we have a trained model, P of X, over our high dimensional space, for example, over images. And let's imagine we want to generate an, images, an image like this image of a cat. What we would typically do is um, we would first generate some random number, um, like a sequence of zeros and ones, and that random number we will then convert into a draw from this complicated high dimensional probability. And then we would ultimately get an image as an output. Now in data compression, it's exactly the opposite around, way around. We start with a high dimensional data point like this cat image. We also assume we have a probability model of our data, but this time we don't simulate data from the model, but rather we evaluate the likelihood of the model of that image under this probability model. And then we use our favorite um, entropy coding scheme, for example, um, arithmetic coding or Huffman coding to convert this probability into a binary bit string. Right? So in some sense, these two processes are really inversely related to each other. And in particular, um, you can take any given image codec, for example, JPEG, and you can convert it into a generative model by just decoding a random, randomly generated binary bit string. If you do that, it turns out you get something like that you see here. You see this is like a, a randomly decoded, a randomly generated bit string decoded by JPEG. Um, and you see basically the built-in model assumptions, right? So you see that there's some sort of run length encoding built into JPEG, which means that um, you know, autoregressively um, nearby pixels should have similar color values. But then also on a smaller scale, you see basically Fourier features that also tell you that JPEG works sort of on a, on a Fourier basis. On the other hand, if you do this um, with a modern um, neural compression algorithm, you get an image like this. Now, obviously, this also doesn't really look like a cat image, but you see there's much more texture that sort of looks natural. And, um, and this already tells you that probably the model on the right-hand side was, is, is a better compression model because it's kind of more realistically generating structure that you actually find in, in real-world data. So it might be the better probability model um, uh, of, of, of your images. And so in the next couple of minutes, we'll want to understand how these neural compression methods really work and how you can actually further improve them using tricks of the trade from um, variational inference. Uh, could you explain again this JPEG picture? Uh, is, where, 
is that an yeah. image in the image domain or in the compression in the um, zero one? No, this is actually um, this is really uh, in the image domain. So you you know when you when you encode or when you compress an image, right? You get a binary bit string, and um, when you uh, decompress an image, you take a binary bit string and uncompress it. And here, the binary bit string is randomly chosen with equal probability between zero and one. And when you then use JPEG to decode it, you get actually an image, <laughs> right? And this is kind of a typical characteristic image that you would get when you do this with JPEG. I see. Whereas on the right hand side, this is a, a randomly generated image from a neural network based uh, compressor. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Okay, so how does this um, image compression with variational autoencoders work in, in slightly more detail? Um, well, first of all, let's start with a distribution of data points such as images. Um, and then we uh, take a trained uh, variational autoencoder model to map this image into a lower dimensional latent space. Right? And this lower dimensional latent space is a dense vector of um, real valued numbers like this one. Now, naively, you might think, well, maybe we're done now because, you know, obviously we have achieved some dimensionality reduction. Um, but it turns out that um, dimensionality reduction alone is not sufficient to really see any compression gains. Um, you also want to have a latent representation that you can represent with very few decimal places, right? Otherwise, you can, if you remember literally every decimal place, you can store as much information as you want in a single real valued number. So for this reason, we need to truncate this real valued vector to something discrete, for example, by rounding to the nearest integer. And now we have a discrete object on which we can apply lossless compression. And we can convert this vector into a binary bit string. If we want to decode this image, we can again undo the lossless compression. We get the same identical binary vector out. We push it through the decoder. And this ultimately generates an image which hopefully resembles our original training data. Now it turns out that the loss function that people used in the early days of neural uh, network-based image compression ended up being identical to what a totally different community also used as a loss function, namely the approximate Bayesian inference community. It turned out that these um, uh, neural network-based compressors are in fact variational autoencoders. Um, now, why is this so? Well, first of all, here on the right-hand side, you see um, the evidence row bound that we just arrived. Right? It's the expected log likelihood of our model plus the KL divergence between our variational distribution and our prior. And note, if we now take this loss function and replace the expectation over Q by um, Q evaluated at a discrete grid point, <clears throat> our objective simplifies, and the first term becomes a quadratic distortion which measures the reconstruction error between our original image and its um, lossy decoded reconstruction. And the right-hand side becomes the, log the, the negative log prior probability evaluated at z hat, our discrete latent vector. Now, this is exactly the rate that you incur if you take your prior as a probability model upon entropy coding. Yeah? So in other words, it really depends the bit rate that you, uh, that you need in order to compress this um, dimensionality reduced and rounded image. And the first term is the distortion term, which uh, measures you know, how confident is that, uh, that the reconstructed image to its original input. Now, um, given this <clears throat> very nice and one-to-one uh, and, and, uh, um, -one correspondence between variational inference and, um, and neural compression models, um, there's an obvious question that comes up, namely, if you know more about variational inference, if you spend years on you know, exploring different variational approximations, can you draw on this knowledge to actually improve image compression? And can you essentially build better neural image codex? Now, um, and the answer is yes, there are several ways in doing so. And I want to quickly present one particular work that we published at NeurIPS um, uh, one and a half years ago, uh, titled Improving Inference in Neural Image Compression. Now, um, it turns out that in this conventional variational autoencoder approach to image compression that I just sketched, there are several suboptimalities. And some of them can be fixed using some sort of clever ways of doing um, better approximate inference. The first trick is related to what's called the amortization gap. 
This is exactly what I talked about a few minutes ago when you remember the story about iterative inference. Um, so it turns out that if you do amortized variational inference, in other words, you predict your latent representation Z based on an inference network or based on an encoder, this is not necessarily the optimal latent representation of an image. It turns out that if you do still gradient-based optimization of your latent state, you can achieve a better loss. Uh, in other words, you can achieve either a smaller rate or a smaller distortion. The difference between the result of amortized inference and sort of uh, optimizing data point specific variational parameters is called the amortization gap. And it can be closed using these iterative inference techniques that I um, highlighted before. It turns out that there's also another suboptimality in the conventional approach to neural uh, image compression, which is related to what, what we call the discretization gap. The discretization gap stems from the fact that um, when we train these models, we actually um, use, we inject noise into our latent representation, which you do when you train variational autoencoders, right? This is called um, the reparameterization trick, and it's basically simulating the posterior uncertainty um, in your latent representation. However, when you then have your trained VAE model and you deploy it, you actually don't inject noise, but rather, as I told you, you're rounding your latent vector to the nearest integer grid. So clearly there is a difference between how you train your model, namely by noise injection, and how you use it uh, during performance evaluation, namely by rounding, right? And because those are not the same operations, there is some suboptimality, um, which we call the discretization gap. So this can be closed by um, doing some more clever way of inference. So even given a trained variational autoencoder, we can actually um, uh, run a technique which we call stochastic gumbel annealing, which is basically a search technique where we search for the optimal discrete vector z on an integer grid, right? Instead of just doing gradient descent in continuous space and rounding to the nearest integer grid point, we do a discrete search. And to that end, we do what uh, we use the gumbel softmax uh, trick from um, variational inference with discrete random variables. There's also a third suboptimality, which I don't really have time to talk about. Um, it has uh, something to do with what's called bit spec coding, which is a um, technique in lossless data compression using variational autoencoders. It's actually very exciting. I encourage you all to read up on it. Um, uh, but uh, what we did here is we, we identified um, ways of doing bit spec coding, not only in lossless compression, but also in lossy compression. All right. Now, given all of these tricks to improve compression and learned models, um, the question is, how much does it make a difference? Right? And to this end, I want to convince you that this is actually pretty exciting and very useful stuff. Right? Um, so what we have here is a so-called rate savings plot. Um, on the x-axis, we have PSNR, which is related to distortion. In other words, it's, um, it's a, a monotonic function of the reconstruction error. Um, in, this, uh, in the negative reconstruction error, so higher is better. So high PSNR is high quality images, low PSNR are low quality images. And on the vertical axis, we have rate savings. In other words, bits rate, bits saved relative to a certain baseline. Now the baseline that we chose here is BPG, which is a state-of-the-art classical image compression model, right? And you see that the bit saved um, the, the bit savings of BPG are zero because it's the relative bit saved to itself, right? So there are, uh, so B, BPG is really the baseline and therefore it's kind of this flat curve. Now, all of the other compression models shown here, both neural and classical are sort of somehow behaving differently at different uh, quality levels in terms of rate savings over BPG. Some are worse and some are better. Now, what we did is we took a, um, at this time, state-of-the-art image compression model by MINN 2018, and we improved its performance only based on improving the variational inference aspect. And to this end, we actually achieved the orange and the blue curves over here. Um, just as a detail, the blue curve is the result, including what, what I call bit spec coding, and the orange one is the one with, without, uh, using only the discrete optimization. And you see that this really significantly improved, improves the, import, the performance across all sorts of different quality levels. So we get a 15 to 20% rate savings. So the, the file sizes get really 15 to 20% smaller at similar or identical uh, quality. 
Right? So quite some significant improvement and very useful in practical setups. It's actually so strong that you see it um, on real world images. So if you pick a high resolution image, um, I didn't show the full image, but here I'm only zooming in on a particular fraction of the image showing that kind of statue and you reconstruct it at a certain uh, bit rate. And now um, we apply stochastic gumbel annealing and we preserve the bit rate, then we actually get a better reconstruction. So you see in the right hand side, I don't know how well you can see that, that there are many artifacts or many, sorry, many details that were sort of only blurry on the left-hand side that you can now see on the right-hand side. Okay. Um, so yeah, in particular, the last two or three years or so, my group did a whole bunch of other compression work that I didn't really have time to talk about, just to kind of give you some pointers in case you were excited about it. Um, one paper, Variational Bayesian Quantization, basically um, came up with a new way of exploiting posterior uncertainty in models for more clever compression. Right? Intuitively speaking, um, if you have, um, for example, a Bayesian neural network or some um, machine learning model with associated uncertainties um, with every dimension of your parameter vector, um, you should be able to truncate um, the dimensions that have, that have more uncertainty to a more aggressive degree then you should be able to remove um, relevant decimal places from parameters that have less uncertainty. And variational Bayesian quantization gives you sort of a, a dynamic and, and, and um, adaptive way of compressing um, a Bayesian, Bayesian models in post-processing um, in, in, in a very elegant fashion. Um, there's also this kind of machine learning uh, niche field, which is called probabilistic circuits. Um, it, you know, there's some very few experts in the world. It's kind of ha having some origins in the more like the AI community, but we had some recent interesting interdisciplinary collaboration where we showed that these kind of uh, unusual machine learning architectures are actually very good at compressing images um, in, a, in a lossless fashion. And um, also we did some work on video compression, uh, which is sort of um, in some sense more applied and um, as you will understand later on, very tightly connected to, to video prediction and video forecasting methods. Are there any questions at this point before I move to the next topic? Maybe a, a, a comment. Are you are you looking for a compression of a uh, one image or a, a, a distribution of images? Um, <clears throat> we um, uh, actually on individual images. So we we want to do exactly the same thing as JPEG or or any video codec, any image codec, right? So you train the model on the distribution of images, but then you want to be able to compress every individual image, if that answers your question. I see. And then compared to the classical ones like JPEG and, mm -hmm. and is there any advantage or not? Yes, there is. Um, yeah, so this is basically expressed here. So, um, so here you see um, the, the, the bits saved uh, relative to the, the best classical um, image codec, which is BPG. Uh, so this is kind of the, the one at zero. Everything on top is better than the best classical codec and everything on bottom is worse than I the see. best classical codec. And you see JPEG is actually so bad that it's not even here. So it's not really considered to be a competitive uh, compressor at all. Well, BPG is a pretty modern good compressor. And, uh, and yes, uh, nowadays more and more neural network based models end up being here. You can see that they're, you know, something of the 20, 30% better than um, in terms of file size than traditional codecs. <clears throat> and and if, you, if you fine tune yeah. them on specific data, you get even much, much better results, right? If you only compress face images or something else, right? Um, then you're even better. And what you are hoping for is uh, training on at one sound distribution, but it can be used for an arbitrary image actually. That is that is the hope. That's the right? hope. Yeah. That is the hope. And but that's actually always how you also evaluate these models. You always you actually always test them out of distribution. You always train on one yeah, data yeah, set yeah, and sure. then you test them on different other data sets. Yeah, yeah that, that's and very then, striking. And, and the reason they generalize so well has something to do with the fact that they actually um they have a very small receptive field, um, meaning that um you really only learn sort of patch level statistics. Right, and those generalize pretty well to other data sets. Um, but you do that much better than what classical codecs do to patches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. All right. Yeah, thanks for your question. <clears throat>
Oh, hi, Professor. Just a, uh, also a quick question that uh, is the learned codex for each uh, compressed image can be also be leveraged for any visualization or explanatory uh, uh, purpose. Like, for example, uh, I'm not sure if interpolating any codex would give you some novel images and help you understand why uh, or understand any principal components in these compressed images. Um, I see. So is your question uh, if these trained image compression models are useful for other machine learning tasks, like understanding the data distribution or... Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah that, that's, a good, that's a good question. I, I don't know if I have a good answer to that. Um, let, let me kind of tell you about the next project and tell you that okay. with, with the help of similar models, we can actually estimate the intrinsic compressibility of data. Maybe yeah, that's yeah. related to, to your question. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Thanks. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, yeah, so I want to talk about some very recent work that we just published at iClear this year, uh, which is on uh, sandwich bounds for the rate distortion function. And I'll explain bit by bit what I, what I mean by that. So, um, so far, we mainly spoke about lossy data compression in which we had, um, you know, a data set of images and we learned to uh, encode these images, convert them into binary bit strings and then kind of decode them again to get sort of uh, images back. Uh, so this was like a, a, a practical compression algorithm and we only used machine learning within this algorithm to kind of learn these encoders and decoders. So this time we want to talk about um, something sort of more theoretical. Um, namely, we want to understand properties of the intrinsic compressibility of a data set. Um, so it turns out that any data set has a so-called rate distortion function. Um, a rate distortion function basically tells you what is the optimal algorithm or what's the best possible performance to compress um, a given data set uh, at a given distortion level. What's sort of the, the smallest bit rate on average that you can achieve independent of any model and independent of any particular compression algorithm. So in some sense, the RD function is, um, can be thought of as the limiting curve that you get by looking at the RD curves of any individual different image compressors. And um, the, um, a lot of research in the recent years has been on sort of pushing the empirical performance of compression methods closer and closer to this um, theoretical rate distortion function. It turns out that the rate distortion function has an information theoretical definition. Um, it's uh, basically defined to be the infimum over all um, encoders, Q of uh, Y given X, um, and then plugging them into the um, mutual information expression subject to a certain distortion level. So some kind of complicated mathematical uh, expression that we'll learn is kind of very difficult to compute. Um, and what we want to do is we want to this time really understand properties of this information theoretical rate distortion function. Can be computed, is it difficult to compute, can be maybe approximated. So to kind of reframe the setup once more, uh, given samples from some data distribution, x from p of x, and given some measure of distortion, rho, right, that has, um, that takes as inputs the original images x and the reconstructions y, uh, we want to um, then evaluate um, the, the following object. Um, I plot the rate, in other words, the average file size as a function of the distortion, in other words, the squared error um, between the original image and its noisy reconstruction, uh, its lossy reconstruction. And then um, every possible um, algorithm and every possible image gives you a point in this plane, right? And if we average over all the images, we get um, a curve. Um, and you see that um, if I allow for more distortion, in other words, the images look more blurry, then I can achieve smaller rates. And if I want to have um, a low distortion, I necessarily need a, a high rate or in other words, a large file size, right? So this is kind of some underlying, um, yeah. So there's really nothing we can do about that. Um, yeah, so the rate distortion function uh, kind of expresses the inherent compressibility of the data. And you can think of this as a generalization of entropy, right? Entropy gives you a limit on the lossless compression of any data set, whereas uh, the rate distortion function uh, relaxes this assumption and it tells you about 
uh, compressibility subject to a certain tolerance level in terms of distortion. Right? Uh, so it's kind of uh, the, um, yeah, um, the lowest achievable bit rate by any uh, lossy compression algorithm. So here it's once more its definition and without going too much into detail, it's, uh, it's kind of a complicated uh, expression involving many integrals and involving many distributions. And it's generally um, intractable to compute analytically beyond uh, very simple Gaussian models. So uh, what does it tell you exactly? Well, it's basically giving you an impossibility result. Uh, if I have, um, if I look at different points at this rate distortion plane, um, the RD function separates uh, points that are feasible by an empirical compressor from those that are just fundamentally impossible to achieve. And, and so, and, and this is really the, the decision boundary, if you will, uh, between those two cases that we would like to understand better. The important thing, as I already stressed, is that there's no simple analytical solution and it's just fundamentally hard to compute this rate distortion function on any empirical data set. Now, um, instead of computing this function analytically or kind of directly computing it, we do something slightly different. Namely, we derive upper and lower bounds to the RD function using variational inference. And then we hope to kind of optimize the parameters of these bounds to make these bounds tight such that we can actually characterize a, characterize a region in which this rate distortion function must live. Yeah. The first result of this paper was that actually any beta variational order, every beta variational order encoder ends up being a valid rate distortion upper bound. Um, the following assumptions are, are being made here. We assume that um, the corresponding variational order encoders log likelihood uh, is exactly the distortion measure that we care about. Right? In other words, if our distortion is squared error, then, um, then the model has to be a Gaussian likelihood. Right? Um, and um, and the first and second term of the elbow are then exactly the rate and distortion as, as, as might be pretty um, intuitive already. Right? Um, the important thing here is that this is really true for any variational autoencoder. Right? So any better variational autoencoder uh, that you optimize gives you a point that, um, uh, and if you scan the different values of lambda, you get a, a rate distortion function out, right? That, that bounds the uh, data model independent rate distortion function from above. Um, there's also like another interesting result, which is the lower bound. And the lower bound ends up being much more difficult. Uh, for this, we need Lagrangian duality uh, we to first derive um, uh, a, a maximization objective over a space of infinite dimensional functions, which we then um, uh, constrain to and parameterize by neural networks. And this actually leads to a pretty ugly optimization problem, uh, which we can nevertheless approximately solve using, uh, using certain variational tricks. Right? So the, the, dis the details of this are kind of getting mathematically pretty nasty, and I'll refer to the paper if you're, if you're interested in the detailed derivation of that. Now, um, how well do these bounds work in practice? Um, well, the first thing that I should say that um, what are our baselines? Now, it turns out that there are simply no good baselines available. It's just fundamentally hard to compute these rate distortion functions. There's only one baseline uh, from the 1970s, which is called the blahut arimoto algorithm, which scales exponentially with the dimensions. And this one can actually only apply to sort of dimensionalities of like three or four dimensions. And you'll see examples of that in a bit. Now, if we're in 16 dimensions, we're already lost with classical methods. And the only bounding techniques that we are aware of are, are our own method, uh, our own method. And for example, here, what, is, what we looked at here is a particle physics data set showing some uh, you know, decay um, results of a, of a particle decay, which can be characterized by a 16 dimensional vector with sort of complicated dependencies between the, these different dimensions. And here, what you see here is um, the upper and the lower bound uh, of the rate distortion function um, in, in, uh, in dashed dark red and in solid uh, light red as the upper bound. And anything here in between is, a, is, is like uh, the region in which this fundamental information theoretical rate distortion function should live, right? So we've bounded it up to that level of precision. And now you might ask, is this kind of a trivial result? Because I told you every empirical compression algorithm already gives you an upper bound. And so what we did is we 
uh, deployed a pretty modern neural image compressor, and we didn't get as close to that um, bounded region as our, our more tighter um, variational upper bound here. Right? So we see that there's a sizable gap, and um, um, current algorithms are still pretty far away from the original uh, that particular rate distortion function. Now, um, if we go down to two dimensions, so we really project it down to two dimensions, then we have a baseline, right? Then we have this Blahut Arimoto algorithm, and we use it basically as a, as a sanity check and, and really confirm that the true rate distortion function in this two dimension setup is indeed in this uh, sandwiched region, right? Now, um, we can go beyond 16, we can go to 33 dimensions. So this, this is a spoken MNIST data set, um, kind of consisting out of these uh, spectrograms. And again, we can apply our upper and lower bounds and we can sandwich the region of the true rate distortion function. And again, it's not a trivial result because the best performing compressor is still away from the underlying rate distortion function. Um, again, we verified this comparing to that 1970s baseline. Um, and finally, maybe most interestingly here is we can also do this to GAN generated images. Um, I should already tell you upfront that it's actually very hard to scale these methods to realistic um, natural images. In particular, the lower bounds don't scale so well, but, it, but nevertheless, we could actually upper and lower bound the rate distortion function of artificially GAN generated images. For example, variations of the stock image that you get by sort of um, constraining the latent space of a GAN to a four dimensional sub manifold. And if you do that, again, you get pretty tight bounds. And now you can actually compare this to image compression methods uh, like MININ 2018 and MININ 2020. And you see that there's quite a sizable gap right, between the true rate distortion function and these best performing neural uh, compression methods. Right? So this gives us a lot of hope that we can actually get much better compression if we just carry out this line of research. Now that that said, those are high resolution images that have a very low intrinsic dimensionality. Um, now, if you go to realistic images, things look a little bit less exciting, uh, but still interesting. Um, so this is again, a related plot showing the PSNR as a, as a function of the, the rate. Um, so higher is better. And we see again that we can derive sort of a, a, a region um, we can basically show that there, every, every point here in this um, shaded region is currently infeasible by any existing compression methods, but should be feasible in theory, right? According to our variational bounds that we just derived. And again, we don't know how tight these bounds are. It could be that there are much more compression gains um, available than we currently see. And right? so you can think of that as an analysis tool of any existing um, compression method for a, and, and essentially evaluating the fundamental difficulty of compressing any empirical um, data source. <clears throat> All right. Any questions before we move to the next topic? I see we also have only 15 minutes left, so I have to be fast. Yeah, I have some quick question, Professor. Uh, sure. So I, I, I think that this uh, kind um, this kind of intrinsic dimension can also be regarded uh, or, or the for example, under same uh, ex, ex, uh, amount of distortion, how many how many base rates you need to encode the image? This this rate can be regarded as the complexity of the whole data set, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. If your if your sandwich if your rate distortion function is 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 very high and, and far away from the corner, it's mm -hmm. essentially a difficult it's a difficult data set to compress. That's exactly right. It's it's right. really related to you know, you get the you get the entropy actually as a limit uh, of of zero distortion, and you can think of this as sort of generalizing the entropy to 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 finitely yeah to a distortion tolerance, if you will. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and my my further question is that uh, I I think I saw some papers on trying to measure the uh, either the intrinsic dimension of the data or the complexity <laughs> of the data set. Uh, somehow, Peter, I can ring the bell is that, uh, for example, I, I think Professor Tom Golston have some intrinsic dimension about the data uh, that mm -hmm. uh, by measuring the uh, a a density based measurements, basically to uh, calculate how dense the data set uh, is uh, around mm -hmm. in some samples. And mm -hmm. there are also some other complexity measurements about the data, for example, using some topo topology. 
uh, mm -hmm. per persistence. I just wonder if uh, your, your opinions on these different kinds of complexity, because uh, yeah. uh, all, all, I, I think all these complexity measurements have some uh, have different assumptions on the uh, on the way they measure, for, for, for example, some of them use the Euclidean distance. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe it's, uh, some of distance is not, uh, does not make sense on the images. So mm -hmm. I just wonder what's your opinion on, on these different ways to measure the complexity and, uh, and for example, what kind of scenario we should yeah. use, what kind of, yeah. Yeah, no, those are those are great questions. I mean, first of all, I should say that I'm not super familiar with those papers, but I mean, I would, I would be a little um, at least skeptical about the concept of an intrinsic dimensionality of a data set. I mean, the, the intuition is really, you know, we always have this intuition, right, when we draw data in a two dimensional mm -hmm. plane. But if you think about it, right, I mean, typically you are in millions of dimensions in pixel space, and you you typically have like a much fewer data than you have dimensions um mm -hmm. so it's it's a little it's a little unclear what the intrinsic um dimension actually looks like if the data are sort of sampled sparsely um but yeah, it, it's at least like say a sort of slightly controversial topic i would have to look into the exact definitions of how the intrinsic dimension is defined whereas i would say the rate distortion function is always defined um mm -hmm. but but yeah i don't i i cannot give you more <laughs> A more okay, competent okay. answer because I, I would but but it's it's a good point we were thinking about connections there as well and maybe there are some interesting connections indeed um, okay okay yeah. thank you very much thank you all right yeah so i want to spend the last 10 minutes or so that i have on sort of drawing interesting connections between data compression and uh video forecasting um first of all um uh, this is now a sort of seemingly a different topic, right? We're now talking again about time series modeling and the most general form of a, of a, a latent variable model uh, with uh, um, for a sequential uh, in a sequential setup is can be written as a product over time. And then you have a likelihood P of X T given previous observations X smaller than T and latent variables, and then a prior over latent variables, right? And then of course, um, the simplest specialization of this formula is the hidden Markov model in which you really have a Markovian transition and the likelihoods are only dependent on the latent variables, right? And so these models have been dealt with uh, for many, many years, but of course the more interesting models emerge when you take the original formula and parameterize all these conditional distributions using neural networks, right? So for example, if P of ZT given Z minus one is actually a nonlinear function of ZT, you already get a, a much more interesting model out and and, and these kinds of models are really scaling up to, you know, low resolution videos at least that allow you to sort of forecast the evolution of, of, a, of, a, low of, of a low dimensional video. Now, um, there's been a lot of uh, work on this, uh, of course, right? It started uh, to my knowledge in 2014 with uh, Bayer and Osendorfer and then variational RNN is a paper from Benjo's group, which is very popular. And there are all sorts of extensions of that. Um, and you know you can make them deep and hierarchical and whatnot. I uh, don't really have time to review all of these different models, but there's an entire zoo of these stochastic um, uh, sequential deep latent, uh, latent variable models. <clears throat> yeah, so I kind of got into this uh, in 2018 when we looked at our uh, disentangled sequential variational autoencoder. The idea is that you have sort of uh, a, a sequence of latent variables, ZT, uh, to Z1 through ZT, and you have a sequence of observations. You assume that there's an underlying low dimensional time series, but in addition, you have a global latent variable that affects every single frame. And then um, if you uh, choose the architectures and dimensionalities wisely, you can actually disentangle um, static information inherent to all frames from the underlying dynamics such that you can then conditionally generate videos with uh, similar appearance uh, and, and different dynamics or identical dynamics and, and, and and different um, appearances. Now, since then, there's been a lot of uh, development, of course, um, <clears throat> but uh, up to date, people are mainly looking at kind of relatively simplistic um, videos. Uh, so for example, KTH is one example that you see here, uh, kind of black and white videos of, of a person walking through the, uh, the video. And um, even for those problems, it's actually very difficult to generate um, coherent dynamics as you see there, right? Many VAE-based models lose objects along the way or they're, um, and, and they're also, besides that, uh, never scale to high resolution, right? Everything is confined to this relatively low dimensional uh, pixel spaces. Furthermore, um, 
we found that the evaluation of, of these video prediction models is not always great. Um, people mainly look at perceptual metrics, but they don't really evaluate forecasting metrics, right? So we don't never look at the distribution of, um, of possible frames and we don't really evaluate them properly in a, in a, in a, in a properly statistical way. So lots of things to do here. And um, my work did, my group did a bunch of work here, which I can really talk about. Um, but I wanna walk, talk about one particular work. Um, and this relates to scaling up uh, these video generation models to higher resolution videos, not quite full resolution movies, but still, uh, you know, um, to, to kind of multiples of, of, of the dimensions that people currently deal with. And also generating long-term high resolution content. And um, the idea is inspired by our earlier compression work. Um, namely, uh, our first idea was, can we actually use a video codec as a generative model, right? Video codecs are by design generated for high resolution content. So can we just, again, randomly decode a bit string and, and automatically generate a high resolution video? Now, how do these models work? Um, so here's a paper from Augustin et al, uh, 2020. Um, where, um, which shows you how these neural network-based video codecs work. So imagine you have a video with a complicated um, object like, or event like an explosion that you see here. So there are lots of details that are very hard to predict, right? Whereas the background of this scene might be fairly static and easy to predict. Now, the first thing that these models do is they kind of predict the next couple of frames based on past frames. And with this prediction, they're actually pretty good at you know, predicting the background, but then obviously the model catastrophically fails predicting all the details of this explosion because they're just not easily predictable. Now, nevertheless, you can still compress the residual between the ground truth frame and that prediction. And this gives you typically a sparse image, which you can fairly efficiently and cheaply compress, such that when you then decompress the video, you first do your deterministic prediction and you add your, um, your sparse residual that you would cheaply compress. And this then gives you your, your next frame. Um, now the question is sort of um, how can this be done for video? Uh, can this idea be applied to video generation? And the problem is, um, unfortunately, these video codecs are, are not very good at that because they're not really trained for generating coherent motion. There, everything is very local. Every everything is very patch based. And so, if you run them as uh, generative models, you'll basically get a, a, a not a very good video out. The question is though, can we fix this? And the short answer is yes. Uh, we can actually use diffusion probabilistic models and use them as um, uh, compressors for our sparse residual, right? And then later on, after we generated a sparse residual using a diffusion process, add this to the video and then generate hopefully a high resolution coherent video. Now, what are these diffusion processes? Um, I guess some of you have already heard about them. Uh, you know. You basically have a, 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 a process that slowly corrupts the image by adding more and more noise to it. And you're interested in the posterior of the diffusion process, right? So given a, a slightly more noisy image, what's the, pos the pro posterior probability of where you came from? What is the less noisy, the less, sorry, the less noisy image where you came from uh, to arrive at the noisy image? And once you've learned this denoising process, you can actually sample uh, from that process, starting from random noise and generate high resolution images. Now, uh, what we did is we generalized this to video. Um, uh, so this is currently a preprint only, but we're pretty excited about it. Um, so um, the idea is, is roughly as follows. It's actually inspired by this video coding architecture. You have a sequence of frames um, that you use in order to make a deterministic next frame prediction. Now, what's missing is the stochastic component. And to this end, we run a diffusion process, uh, which is conditioned on the frame sequence to generate a sparse residual to that prediction. And then those are two added up. And this is then the next frame that you generate. So on the right-hand side, you see the corresponding uh, graphical model for that. Um, if, you, if you do that and you compare our method with um, various GAN-based methods and variational autoencoder methods on sort of slightly more high resolution content, you see sort of some very promising results. So here, the vertical axis is time going from uh, uh, small times to large times into the future. So this is about a second projected into the future. So in the ground truth, you see a scene from a car. There is a car coming in from the side and also the car as a whole moves to the front. Uh, our method sort of preserves a lot of structure and, and understands that this car, I'm oh, sorry, that this 
are really moving and it's kind of elongated it, uh, elongating it, and, and you see that there's some sensible dynamics going on. Whereas um, a lot of these other methods become either blurry in the case of VAEs, or they become very um, lots of artifacts uh, if they're GAN based. Um, you can also um, evaluate this quantitatively uh, using a method called uh, CRPS, uh, continuously ranked probability score, which compares cumulative uh, distributions. Um, inverse CRPS is good, low inverse CRPS is bad. So as you can imagine, if you predict only one frame into the future, you're pretty good still. And then the performance will exponentially decay as you go to further and further future frames. Um, and long story short, the, uh, the diffusion-based model performs better than both variational autoencoders and GANs on various data sets. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. I want to thank my students, in particular Ibu Yang, Vihan Yang, Prakar Srivastava, and a former postdoc, Robert Bamler, who is now a professor in Germany, and Joe Marino, a collaborator who is now at DeepMind in, in London. Uh, so thank you very much. And I am still here for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for this great talk. Uh, any questions from the audience? Okay, I, I just have a very personal uh, small question. I, I'm just, uh, because I'm not an expert in the uh, learning-based compression methods domain, I, I just wonder uh, uh, how many uh, industry groups or companies are start using the learning-based comp compression methods uh, in contrast to the uh, classical non-learning-based non methods? Yeah, that's a good question. So. Um... I mean, this is kind of, it, it sounds very applied, but it's actually at the moment still sort of fundamental research, I would say. Um, I think a lot of companies see the potential mm -hmm. in, in those methods, but haven't really deployed them internally, or at least I, I don't know. Uh, so I know that Qualcomm does a lot of research on that. Uh, they're also close collaborators of ours. Um, and, and uh, you know, you might kind of just Google it. Qualcomm is, is, is doing some, uh, has done some really kind of impressive results on video coding. Also in terms of speed, also not only in terms of performance. Uh, Google, of course, has some very good researchers um, who were doing very foundational work on this. Um, they have an entire team where one of my students is currently interning at. Um, um, uh, Disney has compression researchers. Um, lots, of, lots of companies do have uh, at least a few. Facebook has, has a team. So um, I think they're all sort of investing in it. And it's, it's sort of unclear where this goes, but at least they see the potential of those techniques. Yeah. I see, I see. Thank you very much. Mm. Sure. All right, if no more questions, uh, let's uh, thank Professor Stephen ben, uh, Men's uh, great talk today. And I really enjoy this uh, compression and uh, the rate distortion projects. Thank you very much. Thank you too. Thank see you. you. Have a nice Thank day. You. Thanks for having me.